in David's reading this morning in Psalm 46, verse 10 stood out to me thinking about our lesson today. The psalmist writes, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted over the earth. And God demonstrates His power, His lordship um, in this great miracle that we're going to study this morning. For me, as a child growing up and having Sunday school classes, I don't know how many times I was taught this portion of Scripture. And certainly, growing up as a child, every Easter uh, around that time, while the networks would, would show the Ten Commandments, and I always like to watch Cecil Bill Cecil D. I don't even remember his name now. There we go, DeMille. His uh, his movie and uh, Charlton Heston was you know a, a well tanned, in shape dude, and uh, he made a good Moses. The Bible says Moses was the most humble man that ever lived, and 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 I don't want to spread praise on Moses. Moses was God's servant. Okay, just like we are God's servant. But Moses was willing to be used by God in a mighty way. Even, in, even as we've studied, Moses kind of put up a fight. He argued he wasn't the man. He, he didn't have uh, uh, good control over his speech and, and just offered up excuse and excuse, but still God persisted and, and Moses acquiesced and became God's man. And so we come to the point now in this story, we're in Exodus chapter 13, where um, God has uh, indeed uh, made way for the Israelites to leave Egypt. And, and, and I want you to keep in mind as we study this text this morning that all these Egyptians, or all these Israelites rather, have ever known is slavery. None of them knows what freedom is like. None of them. That they all they know is slavery and being subjects to the Egyptians. So we want to be hard on the Hebrews when, when we when we think about their grumbling and, and their complaining, but they've never known anything different. They are babes in faith. They they don't even know about Yahweh God. Uh, it had been generations since Jacob had brought his family into Egypt, and, and they have been uh, generation after generation introduced to the Egyptian gods, and their nation was full of idolatry. And so God's taking this people group that uh, he promised the land of, of Canaan out of a culture where they have experienced nothing else. And he's going to bring them in to be their own nation. And at the end of this section of scripture, they will place their trust in Yahweh God. And they will place their trust in his servant Moses. And it's, it, it's, it's quite a transformation when you think about it. These are babes in the faith. Moses has come and demonstrated these miracles and the the Hebrews have been spared from the misery that the Egyptians suffered and now it's time to go. Verse 17 is where we're going to pick up in chapter 13. It says, When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine company, though it was shorter. For God said, If they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert toward the Red Sea, and the Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Wow. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle, but yet God did not take them through the way of the Philistines. And I've got a map. Uh, no, that's not it. Uh, I've got a map that <laughs> suits my belief in the route of the Exodus, and the Israelites start off up here in Ramses in the land of Goshen. And they're going to travel southward. And recent archaeological evidence has now uh, put 
uh, great faith in the fact that the Israelites crossed the Red Sea at the Gulf of Aqaba instead of the Gulf of Suez. Suez, you'll see, is on the left, and Aqaba is on the right. Now, as they travel south, you'll see the city of Sukkoth, and you'll see at the bottom uh, of the map where they actually get shut in, it says, at Exodus 14, 13, at pi Hahiroth, which means mouth of water. Now, what you need to understand is none of these places are known with any certainty. They're, they're educated guesses. People don't know where any of these places are that are mentioned in Scripture. You notice over here we have uh, Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb. Um, I messed up. Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb is right here. And this Kadesh Barnea that's, that's listed with Petra and Selah there in the middle of your screen, that is one location that they are for certain of. And that is one place that the Israelites uh, went to. But they are currently now leaving the land of Goshen and they're going to travel south and we suspect to the east side of the uh, Gulf of Su uh, Suez. And they're going to travel south and come down here to the Red Sea. And the, the Red Sea is another location that's named in Scripture. And we know that the Red Sea is, is where they went across because the Bible says it in so many different passages. Um, in, Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy 11, 3, um, Moses writes, The signs he performed and the things he did in the heart of Egypt, both to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his whole country, what he did to the Egyptian army, to its horses and chariots, how he overwhelmed them with the waters of the Red Sea. And in Hebrew, the, the name is Yam Sup, and it means sea of weeds or sea of reeds. A lot of scholars have tried to uh, play down the crossing of the Red Sea since it has this title, Sea of Reeds, that perhaps the Red Sea was only 18 inches deep and, and God dried up that, that land with the east wind, as Scripture says, and the Israelites went across. But it doesn't explain how there were walls of water on each side of them and the Egyptians came through and were absolutely destroyed. They were drowned, the whole army, by God's mighty hand. Now, that would be a greater miracle in my mind. If God drowned the whole Egyptian army in 18 inches of water, that would be a true miracle. Okay, so either way, God did a incredible thing. He, he is the, the ultimate general. God, God's strategy is, is sound and foolproof. Another couple of places where um, Scripture refers to the Red Sea is in Acts 7, 36. He says, He led them out of Egypt and performed wonders and signs in Egypt at the Red Sea and for 40 years in the wilderness. And then lastly, in Hebrews eleven twenty nine, he says, By faith the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. So there's a lot of certainty. Did you ever think about how wide a place that God had to park back the waters for them to cross? A lot of times we think about, oh, it wasn't very wide, maybe 20 feet, but it had to have been real wide to, for the, all that number of people. I, I read... There was, large, there was a large number of people, animals and yep. everything. I read in one commentary. Now, they did this in the night. Kind of, We're kind of jumping ahead, but that's fine. They, they crossed the Red Sea in the night. Um, and I read one commentary said if they just were in columns of five, that the entire nation, the two million people or two to three million people could pass through that column of water within about four to six hours. Okay, so that's a lot of people. But I, I'm like David, it must, have been, it must have been substantially wide for, especially for chariots to follow in and pursue them. So it, it was a great miracle. But God led them out ready for battle. 
and likely they were equipped with spears and slingshots and uh, rudimentary weapons. They they weren't they weren't uh, powerful uh, with their weapons and 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 military materials like the Egyptians were. So Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid and you must carry my bones up with you from this place. So Joseph, post-mortem, got to participate in the Exodus. And I I think that's just wonderful how God includes that detail for us in the scripture. After leaving Sukkoth, and we can look again on the map and, and see where Sukkoth was. They're going to go from there at the top right-hand corner. You see Sukkoth, and they're going to come down to Etham, where it says they were shut in. Okay, I don't know if you can see my little cursor move around, but this is where they're going to end up, down here at Etham. (coughs) By the day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. So so God had appeared to Moses in a burning bush. And now God manifests himself in a great cloud um, that shelters the nation of Israel. Think about this, how hot it would be traveling in the desert but God in his wisdom provides this massive cloud for them to have shelter from the hot sun as they, as they travel southward. And then at night in the desert, it gets really cold. And he appears in a pillar of fire, which not only gives them sight to travel at night, but gives them warmth. And I don't think we think about that part of the miracle of God appearing that way or manifesting that way enough because uh, it's, it's quite... It would have been quite a sight. And that that pillar of cloud, pillar of fire, is known as the Shekinah glory of God. Okay? That that was the manifestation of God's glory in that in that great pillar of cloud. And that will exist with the Israelites all the way until the book of Ezekiel. And the glory of God in Ezekiel leaves the temple that that is the nation of Israel has become such so corrupt that God says I'm out of here and he leaves his his glory went up from the temple and he left and so God is with them manifest in a a specific uh, cloud that they could see for many many years so we'll go on to chapter 14 And the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Pi-Hahiroth between Migdal and the sea. And so we go back down here and we can see Migdal. And there's Pi-Hahiroth, which means mouth of water. And so they're going to be in this area right here. They're, They're pinned in by the gulf and the water. They can't escape they can escape to the north, but that's where the Egyptians are coming from. And so they, they've got their back up against the wall. They're pinned in, and God has done this on purpose. <clears throat> Pharaoh will think that the Israelites are wandering around the land and in confusion, hemmed in in the desert. But I will, And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord, so the Israelites did this. Now what effect does that have on Pharaoh, that they turn back and are hemmed in by the desert? When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, What have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. How quickly did Pharaoh forget about the fact that that God killed the firstborn in every family and there was a great wailing and weeping in all of Egypt because each household lost at least one member of their family and their livestock. Uh, Pharaoh is quick to forget all of the plagues that God had had put upon the nation of of Egypt. So 
He had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots along with him. He took 600 of the best chariots along with all the other chariots in Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh and the king of Egypt so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. Now remember that. Put that in your pocket. The Israelites are marching out boldly because Yahweh God is leading them. How quickly their hearts are going to change and their attitudes are going to change as well. Now, Egyptian chariots were usually manned by three people. There would be a driver and, and two fighters on each chariot. So if they took 600, we know for sure, there would have been 1,800 military men coming after the Israelites. But it also says that they took all of the other chariots in Egypt too. So it's hard to tell how many troops there actually were. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pihiroth, opposite Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. And they were terrified and cried out to the Lord. So it only took us about four verses for the Israelites marching out boldly. And now they're terrified, crying out to God. So their attitudes have changed really quickly. And they said to Moses, they don't have any faith in Moses because they, they, they can't believe what they see. You know, so, so many times... We have to see to believe, okay? And, and we shouldn't think that the Israelites are any different than us. All they see is they are, uh, are, they are having the, the Egyptians bear down on them, and, and all, they think they've come to an end. They think they're going to die in the desert. And they said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the deserts. In the desert. Again, keep in mind, all they have ever known is being slaves to the Egyptians. So Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring to you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. Or you need only to be still. When we are hard pressed and we are attacked, we are um, in a bad situation. What What is our fleshly reaction to bad situations where, where we think there is no escape, where, where our backs are up against the wall. What do we do? Our flesh tells us to fight back or to flee. Okay, And the, and the Israelites are no different. And, and Moses tells them, all you need to do is be still and let the Lord fight for you. And I think so many times we find ourselves in situations that are out of our control and we react, we fight or we flee when we would be better off to be still and let the Lord fight for us. I think that's, I think that's why we as Christians suffer so hard with pride, and all of us do, is because it's an instinct in our heart that, that we can take care of ourselves, that we can, we know what's best, that we can overcome. And that's just not always true. Sometimes the Lord wants to do the heavy lifting for us. And the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. So evidently after Moses told the Israelites to be still, he turned around and prayed to God. It was something like, you know, be still, be still. Lord, what have you got us into? Something like that. Okay. Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so the Israelites can go through the sea to dry, dry ground. Now, Moses is going to make this great gesture with his staff, but God's going to be the one that does the work. 
He says, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so they will go in after them and I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and through his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. So once again, the Egyptians will know that he is Yahweh God by how he inflicts uh, death upon the Egyptian army. Then the angel of God, who have been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. Remember, uh, it said the angel of the Lord earlier when they, when they left out was before them. Now he's going to go back and deal with the army. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side. So neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it to dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea to dry ground with, all, with a wall of water on their right and on their left. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're going to look at, at uh, that section in a little bit, but it does say, uh, they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And it's going to be a comparison between that baptism and the baptism of Christ. It says in verse 1, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. So there's, there's evidence in the New Testament that the Exodus and the miracle at the at the uh, uh, Red Sea did occur. The Egyptians pursued them, and all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, just before dawn, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud and the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. Other translations say that the wheels fell off. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. And then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at daybreak, the sea went back into its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and the horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. So at least 1,800, probably two times that, perished in the sea. Um, the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. And that day the Lord saved Israel from the hand of the Egyptians and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people of the Lord, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. And that was the purpose, not only to save them, but to gain their trust. Um, they had to go from uh, being subjects to the Egyptians to being uh, obedient to Moses and to the Lord. Hebrews 12.9 says that by faith the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. Psalm 78 says, He divided the sea and led them through. He made the water stand up like a wall, and he guided them with a cloud by day and with the fire from all night. And so there's all kinds of evidence in Scripture besides this account in the Exodus that the Egyptian army pursued the Israelites and they were killed in the sea. Now, I don't know how long it's been, but a group of us one Wednesday night, we watched a video uh, about um, exploring the Gulf of Aqaba where this one group of research researchers thinks that the Red Sea crossing occurred. And at the bottom of the sea are... Uh, uh, oh, what are those called? Uh, 
there are structures that are built at right angles that are on the sea like an axle. And the plankton or, or uh, coral has attached itself to these structures. And you can see pictures on the seafloor that look exactly like chariot wheels and axles of chariots. And it, it just gives you chills to think that they have found evidence that on the bottom of the sea at the Gulf of Aqaba that this actually occurred. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you want to turn there in your Bible, we're going to look at that scripture and look at this graph that I have. This is uh, Paul writing to the church in Corinth. He says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud, in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, that angel of the Lord, and the rock was Christ. Now that gives me goosebumps, that it was, it was Christ that led them, that went behind them and protected them. I mean, Christ intervened for the Israelites and their well-being, just like he intervened for us. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some as they did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. So how does that compare? Okay, here we go. Israel as a type of church. If you want to look up at the screen. We have the first column. You see it says Israel. First, they were a bondage of, in Egypt. They, they had a deliverer named Moses. Moses believed. Egypt was forsaken. And they had the Passover. Then they went through the Red Sea, had freedom from Egypt, heavenly food provided, that being manna. They received the law of Moses. They worshiped in the tabernacle of God. And the unfaithful perished, just like the 23,000 that was mentioned. And then the faithful crossed the Jordan and entered into Canaan, as was promised. Now the church, that being us, we were slaves held in bondage to sin, we have a great deliverer, Christ Jesus. Christ believed, sin was forsaken, and the death of Christ led us into baptism into him, where we have freedom from sin. We have heavenly food provided, that being the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. We have the law of Christ. And if you're wondering what the law of Christ is, just go to Matthew 5 and read Matthew 5 through 7, and you'll read the Sermon on the Mount. And that is uh, a great um, illustration of the law of Christ. We have worship in church instead of tabernacle worship. We worship together as a church, as believers together. The unfaithful will perish and go to hell or death. And the faithful will, will die too, but will enter into heaven. So it's a great comparison. Um, and every week we participate together in communion to remember the death of Christ because he told us to do this in remembrance of him. And that is a time we're going to share together right now. Uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this great example that you've given us in Scripture of salvation for the Israelites, knowing that you rescued them, that you brought them through the water, and they 
were on their way to the land of Canaan with the Egyptians no longer pursuing them. And it's just like that for us, Lord, as we enter into the waters of baptism and we are uh, saved from our sins. Christ washes our, our blood, so to speak, away and we are made white as snow and we are allowed then to worship collectively and uh, help spread the gospel throughout this world. And Father, I just want to I just want to ask you that uh, you help us guard our minds uh, and our hearts right now to put aside the uh, worries of the world, the things that uh, make us struggle, and to focus upon uh, that scene on Calvary where, where Christ shed his blood and died uh, for a sacrifice or an atonement for our sins. I thank you, Father, for these saints that are here. I just ask that you would bless them, bless their families, bless their homes, Father, give them comfort and peace. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Alan White.